Hello everyone and welcome back to the internet computer developer journey. My name is Jesse and I'm going to continue to be the guide on this developer journey. In today's module 0.2 internet computer terminology, we're going to look at the definitions of some of the terms and tools that we'll be using throughout our developer journey. This will help provide additional context and understanding as we move through our developer journey so we're comfortable with everything that we're working with and developing. In our first episode of the developer journey, I went over a brief overview of what the internet computer is, and I mentioned a brief definition for some of the terms that we'll talk about today. However, today we're going to take a deeper dive into a lot of these terms and look at some in-depth de definitions as well as some visuals to help visualize what these terms mean and how they're used in the internet computer ecosystem. As a reminder, all of our developer journey videos have accompanying written documentation. And as a brief reminder, I will show you how to get back to that documentation from the internetcomputer.org website. You're going to want to go to develop, developer docs, and then you're going to want to select the tutorials button in the top nav bar close to the left of the window. And then today we're going to be using the 0.2 Internet Computer Terminology module that is in level zero pre-flight operations. So this page of documentation provides all of the written definitions that we'll be looking at today. And this is a great reference to come back to if you need to refresh your memory on what one of the terms means or if you need additional context. For this video today, though, I've prepared a short slideshow that just goes through these terms with a little bit more visualization than just writing the definitions on a documentation page. So to get started, we're going to take a look at a screenshot from the Internet Computer Dashboard. If you remember from the previous module, the dashboard shows where all of the nodes on the Internet Computer are located geographically. Remember that the blue circles indicate the geographic location of nodes, and they do not necessarily indicate an entire subnet. So for example, this circle in the bottom left here could be three nodes, but they could be three nodes all located on different subnets. So if we take a look at the group of circles in the left-hand side of the screen, it's another example of a geographic grouping of nodes. Now, I will again reiterate that that doesn't necessarily mean all of the nodes are located on a subnet. So what is a subnet? A subnet is a collection of nodes that operate an independent instance of the blockchain network by running their own implementation of the consensus algorithm. So we talked a little bit about that in depth in the previous module when we looked at the subnet portion of the internet computer dashboard. So when we're talking about subnets and nodes, we're also going to be talking about the replica, which is a collection of protocol components that are necessary for a node to participate in a subnet. So the replica is going to be a bit of software from the internet computer that a node is going to download and run in order to be part of a subnet and thus part of the internet computer. A node is a hardware device that runs a version of the internet computer replica and it participates in the network by hosting canisters. And I talked a little bit about canisters in the previous module, but we're going to go a lot more in depth in their definition and their components in this module. To reiterate, a canister is a type of smart contract computational unit that bundles together both code and state. Now, when we have subnets, canisters and nodes, they're all going to communicate between one another using messages. And so a message in regards to the internet computer is data sent typically from one canister to another, or it's data sent from a user to a canister. So if a canister is hosted on one of the nodes in a subnet, then it's hosted or replicated on all of the nodes within that subnet. Then the canister can receive a message from a user through a traditional web browser or through the command line. It can send a message to another canister on the same subnet, or it can send messages to canisters on other subnets using chain key cryptography. So let's talk a little bit more about canister components and terms. To get started, 
the diagram here on the right starts with what is known as a canister ID. This is a globally unique identifier for a canister that can be used to interact with it. Next, we have what is known as a controller principle. So a controller of a canister can be a person, an organization, or another canister. They're identified by what is known as their principal identity. We're going to talk a lot more about those. It is important to know that a principal can be used to identify a canister, a individual, or an entire organization. Next, we have the canister's wallet. In regards to canisters, the wallet refers to the cycles wallet for the canister. So if you recall from the last module, I briefly talked about cycles and what they're used for. To reiterate and refresh your memory, cycles are used to pay for the canister's resource consumption. To refresh your memory, it, cycles are used to pay for the canister's resource consumption. Next, we have the smart contract. So the smart contract in terms of the internet computer is going to be the canister's application code. They are going to be stateful programs designed to automatically execute, control, or document events and actions according to the configuration of the contract. So the smart contract in this context is going to be what powers your application. Last, we have the canister state. The entire state of a canister at any given point is considered the canister state. It's divided into two portions, the system state and the user state. When the canister state is changed, this refers to the result of any operation, function, call, or transaction that changes the information that's stored within a canister. So to talk a little bit more about the architecture of a decentralized application on the internet computer, it is important to know that there are several different types or categories of canisters. So because a decentralized application refers to a canister or several interoperable canisters that provide a service or a program that has been deployed on the internet computer, it's possible that there are several different types of canisters that serve different functions. For example, the biggest category of canisters are backend canisters. These contain the application's core logic code. These can be written in Matoko, Rust, Azel, Python, or any other programming language that can be compiled into WebAssembly. They typically use actors, which is a process with an encapsulated state that communicates with other actors that are concurrently running. These actors can communicate through asynchronous messages that are received sequentially. Actors then can modify their pr own private state, but they can only alter other actors indirectly through messages. An example of an actor code is the screenshot in the top right, which shows the actor definition for a backend Matoko canister. This provides a very simple function that returns hello and then the text input. In this case, it is a simple echo statement that returns hello and then a city that is passed as an argument of the function. So backend canisters can be interacted with through Candid, which is an interface description language that is used to describe the public interface of a service in the form of a program deployed as a canister. So in the bottom right, there's a screenshot that shows the Candid UI, which is a user interface that can be used to directly interact with the backend canisters defined methods and functions. Next, we're going to talk about the other types of canisters in addition to backend canisters. Typically, a lot of applications will have a backend canister and a front end canister. The front end canister is used to host the user interface for the application and is typically written in a framework like JavaScript, Rust, HTML, CSS, or other UI frameworks. They typically use agents, which are libraries used to make calls to the internet computer public interface, and that's typically how front-end canisters will communicate and transfer data to the back-end canister. Front-end canisters are also known as asset canisters since they hold the front-end assets of the application. Another category of canisters are custom canisters. So these are types of canisters that don't fit into the back-end or front-end type definitions. They may be used for specific individual functionalities or they may combine both front and back end functionalities into one canister for simplicity and ease of development. Lastly, we have system canisters. A system canister is a pre-installed canister that is used to perform a specific task that helps to maintain the internet computer specifically. So the NNS and the internet identity canisters are examples of system canisters on the internet computer.
And on the right, there's a screenshot of a very simple front end canister that is used on a simple voting poll application. And we're actually going to be building this application in a later module in the developing your first DAP module in level one of our developer journey, which is the next level. So now let's talk a little bit about how canisters communicate between one another. When a canister is hosted on a node, it can talk to another canister through a query call or an update call. First, it's important to understand what execution means in the internet computer. In reference to the IC, execution refers to the execution layer, which we briefly talked about in the, in the previous module when we talked about the protocol stack. But the execution layer is responsible for executing the canister smart contract code. And like I mentioned, execution is done via WebAssembly. When a canister's code is executed and it needs to perform a call to another canister, it may be a query call, which is a method that's used to execute operations on a canister. Queries are performed synchronously and they're made to any node that hosts the canister. Consensus is not required to verify the result of a query, so it could possibly return information that may be outdated or unverified. An update is a call that is performed asynchronously and it goes through consensus since it will change the state of the canister that is being updated. All canister calls contain a principal, which is an entity that can be authenticated by the internet computer. Recall that in the slide talking about canister components, I mentioned that a principal can be anything on the IC that can be authenticated. So not just a canister principal, it can also be a user's principal or an organization's principal. To talk a little bit more about cycles, so canisters pay for their resources, such as CPU, memory, bandwidth, and other resources for both execution and canister calls that are performed on the internet computer mainnet network through the use of cycles. So the internet computer token, which is the network's native token, can be converted into cycles using the current price of the ICP token measured in XDR. XDR is a standardized form of currency that is maintained by the International Monetary Fund. And so it's very similar to a stable coin. And the conversion rate currently is 1 trillion cycles corresponds to 1 XDR. So next we're going to talk a little bit more about tokens and other tokenomic features on the internet computer. First, we're going to talk about ICP, which like I mentioned, is the native utility token of the internet computer. It can be used to participate in the network's governance through token staking on the NNS, and it can also be used to be converted into cycles, which then can be used to pay for the canister's resource consumption. On the IC, the ledger canister is a system canister used to store accounts and their corresponding transactions. So if you make a transaction where you send ICP from one user to another, the ledger will have a record of that transaction. So a transaction on the internet computer is any process that is transferring ICP from one account to another. It can be a typical transfer transaction, it can be a minting transaction that is minting new ICP, or it can be a burning transaction where ICP is essentially destroyed. So now talking more about the NNS, there is a screenshot on the right here that shows the NNS dashboard, which we looked at in depth in the previous module. And we're just going to revisit the definitions of the NNS and what the NNS and SNS are. So the NNS is a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO, which is a form of governance where there's no centralized form of authority. So decisions are made by stakeholders, which are usually determined by staking the DAO's token, like on the NNS and staking ICP and a neuron. And voting on decisions are all proposed through the DAO. Another key component of DAOs is that all activity is executed on chain in order to provide a transparent and verifiable record of activity. So everyone who votes and has staked tokens on the NNS can see a record of how currency is moved, how decisions are voted on, and the outcome of different proposals on the NNS. So the IC is governed by a DAO that's known as the Network Nervous System or the NNS. 
and it also offers decentralized applications on-chain to be governed by what are known as SNSs, which are app-specific versions of the NNS. So any app on the IC can apply to be an SNS and then be their own decentralized DAO that is controlled by the DApps community. Any changes or updates made to the NNS or any SNS are made through proposals, which are a statement that describes a suggested modification in any aspect of the IC or any of its subsystems and sub applications. Next, it's important to cover a couple cryptography terminologies. So a certified variable on the IC is a very important cryptography term and component. It is a piece of data that a canister stores in the subnet's canonical state during the processing of an update or an inter-canister call. So this data is used when a query call is made so that the canister can return a certificate to the user to provide the data's value. So that might seem like a lot of words and we will definitely dive deeper into that and look at a hands-on example in a future module. But the important takeaway from that definition is that typically an update call goes through consensus. And so the result that's returned from that update call can be verified since all of the nodes on the subnet verified that the value of the update returned was correct. A query call, however, does not go through consensus. So like I briefly mentioned when we were talking about the definition of query and update calls, they may return outdated data, they may return data that isn't validated. To help alleviate this and make query calls more verifiable, certified variables are used which start off as an update call and then they're stored in the subnet state and then can be retrieved using query calls. So they are a really useful function that is on the IC. And like I said, we're going to dive deeper into a hands-on example in a later module. Then the next term we have is chain key cryptography, which is an array of advanced cryptographic mechanisms that allow the IC to achieve scalability and functionalities that just aren't possible on other blockchain networks. These cryptographic protocols help orchestrate the nodes that make up the internet computer and help provide new functionalities and workflows such as CKBTC or chain key Bitcoin to enable Bitcoin workflows on the IC. And in the future, it'll also be expanded to Ethereum and CKETH. So that's going to wrap things up for this module of the developer journey. In the next module, we're going to set up our developer environment. So this is going to consist of confirming that we have a couple prerequisites like an internet connection and access to a command line interface. We're going to take a look at downloading some of the tools and packages that we're going to need in our developer journey. And we're going to assure that everything is up to date and ready to go so that we can dive right into developing our first decentralized application on the internet computer. Remember that all of the developer journey tutorials have a corresponding written documentation page on the internet computer developer docs, which will be linked below in the description of this video for you to click and follow along. We'll also include a link to the IC developer form where we can continue the conversation from today's module over in the form. You can also leave us feedback and ideas for future modules of the developer journey and let us know how your developer journey process is going. You can connect with other developers in our Discord community, which will also be linked below. And there will be tons of resources linked in the description of this video if you want to learn more about any of the specific terms or features that we talked about today. We'll see everyone next time. Take care.